world's winning time game, and you can win your favorite food, a PlayStation 2 with five gotta have games, or even Yank and Bank 100 G's in cash. All that for fries? Yeah. Imagine if you won the PlayStation 2. The year is 2003. The year the world would be blessed with the ending of one of the greatest movie trilogies of all time, with the release of Lord of the Rings, Return of the King. What does your heart tell you? They're precious, sleepy eyes. He means to murder us! Never! You don't see it, do you? Come to me. He's leading us into a trap. One wrong turn, one small deny, and seal the doom of us all. The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King, rated PG-13. The video game wars hit its peak with the PlayStation 2, Xbox, and GameCube, with far, far, far too many great games to mention, including Tony Hawk Underground, Star Wars Knights of the Old Republic, and Beautiful Joe. Beautiful Joe! And the first Simpsons episode of the year would be Season 14, Episode 7, Special Edna. There's one person I'd like to thank for this. Mm. Mm. We've had our ups and downs, but I can't imagine life without him. Bart Simpson. And Cartoon Network was riding high with a mixture of programming spanning three different flavors. Cartoon Network proper, Toonami, and the still new Adult Swim. But as this decade would go by, the Cartoon Network seemed like they could do no wrong, we would start to see the cracks forming, all of which we will go over in part two of the history of Cartoon Network. Two thousand three would be a time of change and risk. The first of which would be a transition away from Cartoon Cartoon Fridays. The block would end on May sixteenth of the year, and be replaced with temporary blocks of Summer Fridays and Cartoon Network Fridays, which were just the same basic thing as Cartoon Cartoon Fridays, showing various cartoons and new episode premieres, but with no host and much more scaled down bumpers. It's getting late. But we're not done. Here comes more Summer Fridays. Take a look outside and you'll see moths, lightning bugs, and all sorts of creatures at your door. They're not trying to be pests. They just want some cartoon fun, too. It's Whatever Happened to Robot Jones, followed by Time Squad. It's all right here on Summer Fridays, only on Cartoon Network. But soon, on October 3rd, the new Fridays would premiere. Show me something. You'll be feeling. Might have feel 
now just called Friday. It was a bit of a departure from the original premise. While still being a show that consisted of playing new and old cartoon cartoons, it was now hosted by actual people on an actual set, which included actual kids as a sort of audience. Okay, okay, we've been patient, right? What do you know about this Kids Next Door contest? Come on, I don't want to give it all away. Well, just give us a taste. Okay, well, have you ever wanted to be in a cartoon? You mean like, in a cartoon? Exactly. Well, yeah, who hasn't? Okay, well, watch Fridays next week, and we'll tell everyone how one lucky winner is going to be animated into an upcoming episode of Kids Next Door. Yeah! In a cartoon? In the cartoon. The main hosts of the show were Tommy and Zynga, who would introduce cartoons and have little skits with themselves, the kids, and other characters would pop up now and then, which would include Long Haul, the puppet trucker, voiced by Andy Merrill. What am I hauling? How's a big load of ladders sound to you? Wah! Ha! I thought so! Pretty darn neat, huh? There's plenty of stuff you can do with ladders. Here, watch this video of me using ladders. Look at this ladder. I'm gonna climb it. Hop! Ah! This is one of the many things you can do with ladders. Now watch as I climb down. Hop! Ah! Ah! See, this is the other many thing you can do with a ladder. Fridays would also play with the format by not only being a place to show cartoons in the Cartoon Cartoon brand, but also movies and special events. Welcome back to Fridays. It's 8 o'clock right now, so that means... So that means it's time for tonight's movie. We're up. Pokemon 3, the movie! Wow. This is the third Friday in a row that we've shown new Pokemon movies, isn't it? It, it is. Of course, it is November. November, right. And every night this month, we've had a bunch of new episodes of your favorite shows, haven't we? All week long, and we've still got another week to go in the month. Another week of November. Wow, you love saying November. Why is that? Well... It's just that everybody else is in the middle of November. You know, sounds very negative, November. Hey, it's getting dark earlier. We can't stay outside as late because it's November. Okay, I can see that. <laughs> but not us. No, we're individuals here at Cartoon Network and everyone here who watches us. Mm -hmm. We're fighting the lighter side to the month. A month where many things are fresh and new. It's November! November! Okay. Along with these changes, we would also see a change to Grim and Evil, splitting into two separate shows. The Grimm cartoons would continue with the Grimm adventures of Billy and Mandy. And the evil segments would continue as Hector Concarne. Hold up in a tremendous explosion. His brain survived. Stomach too. And was attached to the body of a stupid circus bear. I am that brain. My name is Hector Concarne, and I will one day rule the world. <laughs> <laughs> Other than these two shows, there was not much more new stuff airing on Cartoon Network proper, other than a few acquired shows. However, things were still flying high on the Absolution with Tsunami. This would start with a new change. Unlike the previous Tom, this change would not be presented in an on-air event, 
instead being told in a digital comic book on the Toonami website. The comic, Toonami Endgame, tells the story of a space pirate named Orsalette Rex, kidnapping Sarah and destroying both Tom and the Absolution. Luckily, Tom is saved by fellow scrapped robots who repair and improved his body, giving birth to Tom III. The comic ends, of course, with Sarah's rescue and obtaining a new ship, the Absolution Mark II. With a new look and a new ship, also came a new slew of anime and action shows. Anime that was starting to skew more and more adult, including such classics as Dot Hack's Sign. What happens when a game becomes real and none of the rules apply? For a young sorcerer named Tsukasa, the virtual world of the game has become his reality. Where am I? Inside, Tsukasa can fight, make friends, feel pain. Uh, Tsukasa? The only thing he can't do is log out. Enter the world of Dot Hack Sign, premiering Saturday, February 1st at 3. Let me go! Hate the game, not the player. I mean. Only to mommy. Yu Yu Hakusho. On the road of life, second chances are rare. Watch out, kid! But for Yusuke Yunameshi, fate has intervened. This is weird. You have all that's required to be detective of the spirit world. That's a fancy title. Between the world of the living and the realm of the dead, he is both champion and protector. <laughs> Yu Yu Hakusho premieres Monday, March 3rd at 6. Now die. Only Toonami. Romy Kenshin. A once legendary killer has taken an oath to protect the innocent and never kill again. But old memories seldom fade, and bad habits die hard. Die, but don't die. Over here. The Romy Kenshin. Premieres Monday, March 17th at 6.30, only to Bonnie. And Cyborg 009. Black Ghost turned them into cyborgs. All they want is a little peace and quiet. I don't want to fight anymore. Cyborg 009. Weeknights at 6. Being happy We would also see the premiere of the slightly overhated Dragon Ball Z sequel, Dragon Ball GT. Goku Smart. Do I have to go back to school? And there's new Dragon Balls. The star is black? Sounds like trouble. Soon all life forms will be robot mutants. How can a little body like that part of such enormous power? A show so explosive, we can only show it once a week. Dragon Ball GT starting Friday, November 7th at 6.30. Big things get hit by small packages. Which was good timing, as Toonami was also airing the last batch of Z episodes at the time. Speaking of action cartoons, both Toonami and Cartoon Network would see, in 2003, the premiere of one of the greatest entries of the Star Wars canon to date. Summer, you can feel like a hero with Ruffles and Doritos 3D snacks, and Star Wars Episode 2, Attack of the Clones. Collect all the cool 3D star picks and see the hidden images only in specially marked bags of 3D snacks. This summer, find a hero inside. The previous year saw the release of Star Wars Episode 2, Attack of the Clones, the second film in what is now known as the prequel trilogy. Needless to say, it had a massive cultural impact and seem to be everywhere in terms of tie-in deals. What are you guys doing? Now you can feel like a Jedi with new Gogurt glow-in-the-dark lightsaber tubes. There's 16 different tubes for a limited time only. Mom's gonna be back in 30 minutes. Cool. 30 minutes. <laughs> Star Wars Attack of the Clones in theaters May 16th. You can grab Gogurt and go. A year later, while the world was waiting for the release of Revenge of the Sith, Cartoon Network would release a miniseries called Star Wars The Clone Wars. Developed and directed by Gendy Tartakovsky, who had already proven his action worth with Samurai Jack, Clone Wars showed stories from the Clone Wars. It was originally developed as a way to see more toys from the Attack of the Clones line, which at the time wasn't really selling well. Gendy would talk about how he was tasked to develop a series in two weeks with a small crew. 
and that it was stressful because I had to translate the world I've loved since I was a kid into something completely different. The first series of episodes would also be the introduction of fan-favorite villain Asajj Ventress, who was originally a scrapped idea from the Clone Wars movie itself, now reincorporated into the miniseries. <laughs> Needless to say, it was a smash. It's hard to say if it helps sell more toys, but it would for sure inspire another Clone Wars series that would air many years later. It was a peak time for action on Cartoon Network, but they were not done taking risks. Toonami's always been crazy about robots, but something just clicked and we've gone crazy. It's big shots making their grand entrance. Die God, take off! Evangelion launch! All forces move out! Here we go! For one week only, we're busting out some of the best giant robot shows ever made. Don't hold anything back! Why? Just because we love you. Let me give you a demonstration of the tremendous power of my new weapon. From the latest. Hit it with everything you've got! Sun wind and madness! To the greatest. Ready, all goggles. We are under attack. It's amazing, even Gigantor's here. Deploy all robots immediately. It's still Giant Robot Week. All next week from 4 to 5 p.m. starting Monday. <laughs> the robots are coming. And so it begins. Only Toonami. Toonami aired a special week of programming called Giant Robot Week. As you can imagine, this consisted of different airings of giant robot shows. Many of the shows had to be edited for content, such as Die Guard, Martin's successor Nadesco, and even Neon Genesis Evangelion, which, as you can imagine, was the most censored of them all. This is man's ultimate fighting machine. Conventional weapons are no match for the angels. Evangelion, move out! It is mankind's last hope. Don't hold anything back! I've never seen anything like this before! Adult Swim had also been seeing some changes. They had dropped the swimming pool footage and moved to more original swim safety looking bumpers. Attention swimmers, we've got a new Sunday lineup starting with Futurama. The Oblongs. Ooh, that was some road trip. The Brack Show. I'm wearing a diaper and I love it! Aqua Teen Hunger Force. Oh boy, that's rotten. C Lab 2021. <laughs> The Ripping Friends. It's the Ripping Time! And Mission Hill. I'm gonna get me a little. It all starts Sunday at 11 on Adult Swim. In late 2003, it would later transition to a style of bumper that would be a staple of the block to this day. These bumps, as they were called, would be text messages shown between shows with different music played over them. They would sometimes advertise new shows, announce what was next, or sometimes just talk to the audience in a down-to-earth and comedic way. These were also accompanied by little artsy bumps, which would be random pieces of art or scenic views with music played over them, another fixture that would continue to this day. In an effort to gain more programming, the block would add more cancelled shows to its lineup, but unlike most of the shows added last year, these airings would mean big things for the shows in question. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday nights at 11 on Cartoon Network. Yeah! Ooh, 
Boom! The action cartoon sci-fi comedy drama that redefines action cartoon sci-fi comedy dramas. What the hell was that? Futurama! This is fantastic. Futurama! It's gonna be fun on the bun. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday nights at 11. And there's only one place you can find it. On a TV equipped to receive action cartoon sci-fi comedy dramas. What does that mean? Futurama, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday nights at 11. On Cartoon Network. Created by Matt Groening, who, of course, is also responsible for The Simpsons. Futurama follows a delivery boy named Fry, who, after a prank pizza order, is accidentally frozen in a cryogenics facility and is left there until the year 3000. Oh, how awful. Did he at least die painlessly? To shreds, you say. Well, how is his wife holding up? To shreds, you say. There he adjusts to this new life as an intergalactic delivery boy. Joined by an iconic cast of characters, including Leela, his ship captain, love interest. A female leader. Fry, shut up. Yes, Captain. Bender, the chain-smoking, beer-drinking, foul-mouthed robot. Hey, I got a busted ass here. I don't see anyone kissing it. All right, I'm coming. And Professor Farnsworth, Fry's distant nephew, who owns the delivery company he now works for. That's my lab table, and this is my work stool. And over there is my intergalactic spaceship. And here's where I keep assorted lengths of wire. Whoa, a real live spaceship! I designed it myself. Let me show you some of the different lengths of wire I used. Futurama had great critical acclaim during its initial run, and had a pretty respectable life of four seasons. But after these four seasons, the series was canceled. The same year of its cancellation in 2003, the show started airing on Adult Swim, where it found sort of a second life. Because of the Adult Swim airings keeping the show alive, love for the show grew, and it led to a revival years later, as a series of four movies. Then, a new season produced by Comedy Central, and now another new revival, that is at the time of this production, is set to premiere on Hulu. The second cancelled show to appear on Adult Swim would be an even bigger boom and provide an even bigger revival. You were right, Lois. TV is evil. First premiering on January 31st of 1999, Family Guy is the culmination of a concept creator Seth MacFarlane had been developing for years previously. I got it. That's the guy from Big. Tom Hanks. That's it. Oh, funny guy, Tom Hanks. Anything he says is a stitch. I have AIDS. <laughs> And then there was that time at the ice cream store. Oh, rum raisin's my favorite. We've already seen a very early concept of this premise in his What a Cartoon short, Larry and Steve. But there are a few other early pilots with the same idea, but closer to what Family Guy would later be. What do you think they eat? Oh, yes, uh, I don't know. It's some kind of like space jerky or something, I guess. You know, yeah, cause, you know, because they're obviously, well, I mean, Shatner is obviously, you know, getting fed fairly well. I mean, somebody, somebody's seeing to that. Yeah, well, I, I think what happens is he uh, eats his food, and then whatever Spock can't finish, uh, he, he eats that too. Oh, uh, where, where, where did you hear that? Episode 65. Uh. Finally premiering in the prime position right after the Super Bowl, the show was a hit to start. However, it was canceled after three seasons due to low ratings. But like Futurama, the episodes were later aired on Adult Swim, where they found a new life. They even aired a previously unaired episode deemed too offensive for Fox. Hi there, I'm Peter Griffin. You might know me from a little show called Family Guy, or you might know me as Jack from Will and Grace, but I wear a lot of makeup for that and I really ham it up with the gay routine. Anyway, next Sunday, Adult Swim is airing an episode of Family Guy that Fox refused to show. But my good pals at Cartoon Network are showing it, although I think they're making a couple of changes because I'm so controversial. <laughs> See the Family Guy episode you've never seen, next Sunday at 11 p.m. on Adult Swim. But because of the success Family Guy was getting on the Adult Swim block, 
Fox would later uncancel Family Guy, and it's still running to this day. However, as of 2021, the show is no longer airing on Adult Swim anymore, seemingly being aired on every other Fox affiliated channel. But while Adult Swim in 2003 was quickly becoming stagnant with so many rejected and canceled shows, 2003 would also be the year we would see the premiere of one of its best and most beloved original series. Venture Bros is the brainchild of two men, Jackson Public and Doc Hammer, although Jackson is credited as the actual creator of the show. Jackson was previously head writer on the Tick animated series, and was hoping to develop Venture Brothers into something for a while, as a comic storyline for a book called Monkey Suit. However, he found his extensive notes were just too much for a short comic book story, so he pitched a full TV show idea to Comedy Central, who rejected it. While working on the Tick live-action series, he was pointed to pitching the show to Cartoon Network. He was originally wary to going with the network because he didn't want to tone down the show in any way, not knowing about the recently launched Adult Swim. Venture Bros would follow the adventures of the Venture family, based on the dynamic seen in classic Johnny Quest cartoons. 911. Please, Rocky is killing people! It's Rocky! Sir, calm down. Now, where are you? It's a big movie theater on Main. Oh my god, Rocky has a knife! You're watching Rocky? Oh Rocky what? Rocky 4 with Ivan Drago? Horror! Another baffling mystery successfully solved by the best family in the universe! Whatever, keep it moving. These shoes are wreaking havoc on my heel spurs. I just can't believe the Phantom of the Cineplex was Old Man Johnson all along. What I can't figure out is why he did it. Dr. Venture, the, the father of the family and man of science, sorts. I have something to show you all. Those of you with weak stomachs should leave now. What you are about to see is a nightmare inexplicably torn from the pages of Kafka. Holy crap, what happened? Apparently, this is the reward I get for years of screwing with super science. Hank and Dean Venture, the, the sons and namesake of the show, who were always looking for adventure and danger. Totally ruined. Special thanks to you. Hankinator, he's never gonna talk to me again. Well, you can't hide in here all night. You have to get back on that horse. You gotta grab her and go, Triana, I am gonna kiss you. Hank. I'm gonna kiss you on the mouth, Hank. probably, and, and you're gonna love it. Hank. What? Uh, you have a stain. What? Ah, come on. Why does that happen? I shook it so hard I almost hit that pink puck. Well, did you dab? What? Dab, did you dab? Uh, no. I dab. Well, I don't. You should dab. Stop saying dab. And Brock Samson their violent bodyguard. Bake on, spare it! Come on, Mr. Poe, just tell me where you put the hand of Osiris and I'll let you go. Basement, under the floorboards. I gotta admit, I always wanted to get Edgar Allan Poe in a headlock. That thing is like a pumpkin. What started as a simple Johnny Quest parody expanded into a vast world of canon spanning many seasons, with memorable characters including Dr. Orpheus, who wants pizza rolls? Henchmen 21 and 24. Gentlemen, choose your weapons. So Sam, are these they who talks like that? The Monarch and countless more. Ah. Hey, hey, what the? Uh, are you raping me? No, oh, uh, I was gonna. But... Gonna? Venture Bros became one of the most beloved series Adult Swim has ever produced. And a series that despite its abrupt cancellation, and its ending possibly being cut short by a single finale movie is a series that will be remembered by new and old fans alike 
for years to come. Go Team Venture! I don't know, they just do that. Adult Swim would also continue airing more adult anime for the block. Many fan favorites like Blue Gender. Yuji Kaido was desperately ill. His only hope of living, suspended animation. 27 years have passed. While he slept, the world has changed. Where are we? And what were those things back there? The blue have destroyed all he once knew and taken over the earth. This isn't a game we're playing. There's no room for amateurs here. Mankind's last hope depends upon his survival. So you'd better hold on tight. Blue Gender, coming up next. Adult Swim. Trigun. In a distant, dusty future, Bash the Stampede is the man everybody wants to get their hands on. Good luck, fellas. You're gonna need a whole lot of bullets. Wherever this man goes, he always leaves trouble behind him. Get down! Over half the town ain't nothing but rubble. It's back to Stampede! He's coming our way! He's coming! Dragon. Premiering Monday, March 31st at midnight on Adult Swim. Draw, partner. And the cult classic, Fooly Cooly, whose popularity would lead to bigger things in the future. Nothing really special ever happens here. In this place. School sucks. My dad's a weirdo. And there's my brother's girlfriend. I don't even know what to say about her. Anyway, life was pretty slow. Until she came along. Next thing I knew, I had things coming out of my head. It's weird, not normal, these horns sticking out. And I had a robot living in my house. And well, a bunch of other weird stuff. She's kind of cool, I guess. Don't lie. You like her. Whatever. It's really not that big a deal. Do you find this difficult to understand? Cartoon Network had also recently become a place for Warner Brothers to premiere many shows based on their established properties. After the success of Justice League, we would see two new shows premiere this year. The first of which was Duck Dodgers. Warp speed ahead, Mr. Brown. What? Warp speed ahead. She's not responding, Captain. What do you mean? We're being fired upon! Engine room, status report. It's not pretty, Captain. The engine shot. The Martians took it out. Captain, there's a friendly starship in the immediate area. Send a distress signal. For some reason, they're not responding. I have visuals on screen, Captain. That's Duck Dodger's vessel. We're doomed. Receiving urgent SOS. Why does he have the wrong number? Duck Dodgers, premiering Saturday, August 23rd at 11.30 on Cartoon Network. If he's our future, we're history. Based on the Merry Melody short of the same name, Duck Dodgers followed the exploits of Duck Dodgers and his sidekick, the eager young space cadet. So, what life-threatening missions are on our agenda today, my eager young space cadet? Why are you talking like that? <laughs> A fine joke, young chum. Even heroes like to laugh now and <laughs> then. Uh, actually, it's a slow day as they battle the forces of Mars. The series expanded a lot from the original short, including introducing the origins of Dodgers being frozen and later being unthawed in the 23rd and one half century, as well as giving Marvin the Martian a boss in the form of the ruler of Mars. Yeah, who invited the Martians? Introducing the supreme leader of the Martian Empire, Her Royal Highness, the Queen of Mars! Ladies and gentlemen, I am pleased to present our entry for this year's competition, the Martian Maverick Six Million. The Maverick features all the latest Martian technology and will be piloted by our undefeated Grand Champion who will gladly destroy any competition. But the other show produced from WB 
would go on to have a larger impact on the future of Cartoon Network than anyone would ever imagine at the time. Here come the Teen Titans, a quartet of towering talents. Kid Flash, whose speed defies the eye to follow. Wonder Girl, swift and powerful super lass. Speedy, whose fantastic arrows perform awesome feats. Aqualad, bold and daring marine marvel. Fabulous foursome for right against might. The Teen Titans. Teen Titans was a DC comic that launched all the way back in 1964. With a team that's drastically different from the one many may know. The original pitch of the Teen Titans was a team of sidekicks, including Robin, Kid Flash, Aqualad, and Wonder Girl. It wouldn't be until about two decades later that the series would be relaunched as the new Teen Titans, and they would look a bit more recognizable, this time being formed by Robin, Beast Boy, Starfire, Raven, and Cyborg, with many other rotating members in its history. This run of the series was incredibly popular, and inspired a cartoon based more on this run. Cartoon Network presents a new series about fighting for truth, justice, and the last slice of pizza. Go! Teen Titans, Saturdays at 9 on Cartoon Network. Originally also airing on Kids WB, it would premiere on Cartoon Network the same year in 2003 to huge fanfare. Cartoon Network would push the show in a big way with ad campaigns, flash games, and more. The show followed the team of heroes as they lived together in Titan's Tower and watched over the city for any threats that may come, including the Hive Academy, Brother Blood, and Slade. So, here we are again. The old haunt. Just the two of us. Slade! Show yourself! Come out and fight! Relax, Robin. I'm not going anywhere. There were a few changes to the show from the comic. For one, they never made any real reference to other DC comic heroes, never really bringing up the fact that Robin was previously teamed with Batman, as well as the villain Deathstroke's name being changed to Slade, to avoid having a character on the show with death in his name. But with these changes do also come similarities, such as Raven's relationship with her father, the demon Trigun, and a toned down adaptation of the new Teen Titans story, Judas Contract, which introduced temporary member Terra before her inevitable betrayal into faction to Slade. I lost my communicator. Give me yours. I don't have it. Then we've got to get back to the tower and... Beast Boy, I'm not going back. I can't. What? Why can't you? Because she's not your friend. She's my apprentice. Originally planned for only four seasons, its immense popularity would ensure it a fifth. The show was a mix of comedy and superhero action, with a bit of anime flair sprinkled in, so much so that the show's original theme was performed by Japanese pop duo Puffy Amiyumi. Teen Titans is a show that many fans still remember fondly to this day, and although its legacy may seem a bit tarnished due to future developments of the franchise, it's clear that fans still remember what made the show great in the first place. Maybe we ought to show him who he's up against. He's totally going to freak this time. Titans, go! Now where did I park that thing? Here you go, Professor. Trash disposal. Uh, uh, it, it check. This is 
Cartoon Network. 2004 brought a new look to the channel and its bumpers, moving away from the powerhouse era to the ever popular CN City era. This era of Cartoon Network would see new bumpers in the form of CN City, similar to previous bumpers that saw various characters interacting with each other in the Cartoon Network offices. This was expanded to a whole city that had elements of all the currently running cartoons living together. With a new look to the network, also brought new shows, the first being the full series from a previous aired pilot, Megas XLR. The brainchild of Jody Schaefer and George Kresick, Megas XLR tells the story of Coop, a slacker mechanic who finds a giant robot in a junkyard and repairs it with a hot rod car for a body. While showing off the new robot Megas to his friend Jamie, a mysterious woman arrives to try to retrieve the robot. Turns out, she is Kiva, a warrior from the future where the robot came from. It was originally a super weapon, meant to fight off an alien invasion a force that somehow found its way to the present-day Earth, who Coop, Jamie, and Kiva must try to defeat with Megas, along with a whole slew of other enemies. Nanimous, Magnanimous. But you probably knew that already. I am kind of famous. Allow me to explain. I own and run the GCCF. The Galactic Combat Championship Federation. His head? Is a body? Megas XLR enjoyed a good two season run, but was cancelled shortly after, still leaving the story open ended. Tragically, still, the show would later be written off for tax benefits, meaning the show can no longer be aired or streamed in the US. Road test? Me? But I gotta go save the world. If I start making exceptions, this whole place would fall apart. to like black shirts quite a lot and it looks like you like it in pink oh i'm just saying oops sorry about that the next show to come from this era was another show from the powerpuff girls creator craig mccracken foster's home for imaginary friends
co-developed with his wife, Lauren Faust, who would later go on to create the vastly popular My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends is about the titular home for imaginary friends, a place where imaginary friends can go after the kids who imagine them grow up, and they can be adopted by other kids who may not have the kind of imagination that can help them come up with their own. The series focuses on Mac, a young boy who lives with his imaginary friend Blue. However, since Mac lives in a small apartment with his mother and mean older brother, Blue starts to become a burden, and Mac is forced to give him up. However, Mac ends up making friends with all the other residents of the home, including Wilt. I'm sorry, is that okay? You sure? <laughs> all right, okay, sorry though. Sorry, sorry, I just stopped. Is that okay? Sorry I keep stopping. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but that's definitely not okay. I'm sorry. Sorry, 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 sorry. Eduardo. <gasps> it's not just a with me. It's flying disco doom that fly around and want to eat me. <sighs> The Wisby wants to eat you. See, it wants to. The Wisby wants to eat you? <laughs> and Coco. <laughs> as well as the owners, Madame Foster, and her imaginary friend, Mr. Harriman. Pooh, you and your rules. Oh, he's always been like that. Ever since I imagined him when I was a little girl, he's been nothing but a hot crust bunny. And her granddaughter, Frankie Foster, a woman who ignited the fantasies of many coming-of-age kids back in the day. All right, guys, meet back here in one hour. And remember, you break, you buy. So keep your hands in your pockets if you have hands. Hey, Beatnik, park your magic bus somewhere else. You're lousing up my hall. Uh, sorry, sir. I'll be in and out in no time. Miss Bellum, get me the Powerpuff Girls. <sighs> the adult has infiltrated the outer perimeter with some sort of ridiculous armored transport. Unload the cheese on me. Colors. Oh! Surely nobody cares if I park it here. Creeper! Creeper! Full oh. of Frankie. Where you been, Pokey? We've been waiting ten whole minutes! Just get in! All right, gang. Meet back here in one hour. Hey, Beatniks! The last original show to come out this year is what you would call a spin-off. Due to the massive success of Teen Titans and its theme, the artists of said theme ended up getting their own show. Hi Hi Puffy Ami Yumi follow the adventure of bandmates Ami and Yumi as they travel the world with their manager Kaz. What a bunch of cowboy lamos. They do not deserve to be in the same room as our righteous rock star moves. At least their horses seemed into it. Newsflash Ami, these yokels are deadbeats. Kaz wouldn't know a good gig if it crawled up his pant leg and died. Now, like many such shows, the two girls were not actually voiced by themselves. Ami is voiced by Janice Kawi, 
who you may remember is the voice of XJ9 from My Life as a Teenage Robot, and Yumi being voiced by Grey Delise, who is the long-running and current voice actress for Daphne for the majority of Scooby-Doo projects. I'm sending you back to Japan in sushi-sized pieces! I'm gonna kick your paisley tushy! Well, yelling at each other didn't make this any more exciting. It reminds me of another celeb cartoon show, at the time, Jackie Chan Adventures, which would also start to air on Toonami at the time, where the title character was not actually voiced by the actor in question, but there would be little segments at the start and end of each episode that would show the real Ami and Yumi doing cute little things. <laughs> WB would also continue to provide Cartoon Network with new shows, in the form of a sequel to a previous hit, and one of, if not, the greatest superhero shows of all time. Justice League Unlimited was an expansion to the original show, in both scale and team. Whereas the original show focused on just seven members, Unlimited expanded the team to many, many more, some of which were slightly more obscure heroes, like The Question, played by horror icon Jeffrey Combs. Private conference room. Original members only, yes. A place where you're free to discuss your secrets and lies. You said something about me in the White House. Not you, exactly. Another version of you, hmm? The series is still held in high regard to DC fans to this day, even more so than many of the live-action movies that have come out recently. But because this year they're all around you, the League is unlimited. Tsunami ah! presents an all-new original series, starring every superhero worth cheering for. Benson. Justice League Unlimited, premiering July 31st at 8.30 p.m. Now where am I exactly? Among friends. There's strength in numbers. Only to me. We come to herald the beginning of a new age. After seven dominant years, the show you grew up with is moving. Witness the rebirth of a legend. I love this job. To on Saturday night. You won't be disappointed at We have no choice but to fight! Four hours of action like you've never seen before. Every week, brand new shows. How about just me and you? Feature length movies. I'll take it from here. Don't you look. Same old goodness. You're way over your head. Starting Saturday, April 17th from 7 to 11 p.m. Long live the fighter. Don't worry, we'll be okay. Moving to Toonami, 2004 was a bit of a transition period for the block. While still the best place for action cartoons, Tom 3 brought a bit more of a softer edge than previous years. It was reflected not just in the show's airing, but also in their presentation. While Tom and Sarah were still present, there was a definite lighter tone to almost everything. The music used, the way Tom spoke, 
and the addition of more little robot sidekicks for the Absolution. Previously, there were Clydes, who were more floating balls, but these new versions were made more anthropomorphized with cute little faces and lasers. The style was also replaced from grungy pipes and ship interior shots to a white background and graffiti that add more color. Along with a change in attitude, Tsunami was also moved in 2004 from weekdays to a single night a week on Saturday. As mentioned, these lighter tone changes also came in the form of new shows, which while still action-based in many regards, could be considered a little lighter than previous years. New shows included the previously mentioned Jackie Chan Adventures. Go Jackie! When the world needs a hero, he's the Chan for the job. Jackie, bam and bam, bam! <laughs> Jackie Chan Adventures, coming up next. A previous kids WB show about the adventures of Jackie Chan as he battles evil forces and tries to collect magic talismans with the help of his niece and uncle. Come, give uncle a hug. Oh, you did not make coffee this morning. Coffee is the only thing keeping uncle's ancient heart beating. You want dead uncle? No. Then you make coffee. Okay. One more thing. We would also see Duel Masters, a children's card game show, brought over to further capitalize on the success of Yu-Gi-Oh! Next Friday, Shobu's on a quest to be the best. You ready? Bring it on! Let the duel begin. You have no idea the world of hurt you are gonna be in. Step into a dimension where magic and monsters rule. Time to check the deck. Duel Masters, next Friday at 5.30. It's all in the cards. Be there. As well, we would see the 2003 Astro Boy series, which was the last series to premiere on Toonami before it switched from weekdays to Saturdays. Now, Earth's only hope against evil is a little boy with superpowers and the soul of a hero. Toonami so. presents the most legendary anime series of all time, Reborn, Osama Tezuka's Astro Boy, premiering Monday, March 8th at 5. Boys don't cry. In addition, Rave Master would air on the channel, the first manga from mangaka Hiro Mishima, who would later go on to create the still successful series Fairy Tale. No power forever. A simple plan. But it ain't gonna be easy. The power of the rave will be mine. I don't think so. Rave Master, Saturday nights at 8.30, Stone. Anger management at work. Only Tsunami. This Toonami would also see Gundam airings in the form of Gundam Seed, which, along with a sequel, Gundam Seed Destiny, is quite controversial in the Gundam fandom, although Toonami would only end up airing 26 episodes of the 50 episodes on the block. The distant future. Space travel is a triviality. Genetic enhancement, a question of morality. Caught in the middle, Kira Yamato will make his choice. My friends are on that ship! As coordinators and naturals decide right and wrong. You did betray your own people, didn't you? Life and death. Fire! Gundam Seed, tonight at 10.30. Reap what you sow. But since Toonami was moving, it left a bit of space in the time slot. However, it would soon be filled by a block with a similar gimmick to Toonami even one created by the same team, but with an even lighter tone. Maguzi was a block that would focus on lighter action shows. In many ways, it would be considered a spin-off to Toonami, since it had a similar theme of a block hosted by animated characters. This time it focused on a young girl named Erin, who would visit a group of aliens trapped in a spaceship underwater. In between shows, 
we would see different bumpers of all the little aliens interacting with each other. The shows for Maguzi would be numerous and quite chaotic for the block's short period of existence. I would recommend checking out the Attack of the Block video covering Maguzi to really get a sense of how often the shows would be changed around. But for 2004, at its start, we would also see the premiere of Totally Spies to the network, a cult hit show about three teenage valley girls living a secret double life as international super spies. The fate of the world is depending on you. Don't forget your gadgets. Totally cute jumpsuits, check! Do this, come inside six. Totally fly jetpack, check! Evil spies aren't the only ones with fancy gizmos. Totally rat, round ass kicks, check! Eliminate those girls once and for all! Hello, rude much? Check out the totally stylish spies of Magoose. Freeze! Get them! Totally spies! Code Lyoko, another cult hit about a team of teens battling an evil computer virus by traveling to a digital world and taking on super-powered personas. Boarding school kids have it easy. Are you ready? Use a big supercomputer. Virtualization. Battle in a virtual world. We're not exactly having a tea party here. Stop an evil villain. Santa's up to something. And save the world. Return to the past now. On second thought, maybe it's not so easy. I'm beginning to wonder if I'm up to the job. Code Lyoko, weekdays at 5.30. Now, which one of you wants to be first? Only on Maguzi. I'm here to say a word about Adult Swim's Aqua Teen Hunger Force. I like it. I also enjoy painting things like this whale. And this whale, he's breaching. Here's another one. See his special hat? He's a time traveler. He knows what the future holds for all of us. With all my whales, I still find time for Aqua Teen Sunday nights at 11.45 p.m. I have silver hair. In 2004, Adult Swim made more efforts to launch some original programming, and it was really starting to hit its stride, introducing two new shows to the lineup, the first being comedy detective show, Stroker and Hoop. Lasting one 13 episode season, Stroker and Hoop was co created by Casper Kelly, who would later go on to create other projects for Adult Swim. The show centered around two freelance detectives as they bumble through different cases. Hello, sir, we found your daughter. Yes, sir, you're gonna have her in about an hour. What are you doing? I, I thought we were gonna talk her in. It's hey, right your way, Hoop, but if she makes one false move, I'm pumping her. The show had a lot of parody elements of different action sources the concept being born from many buddy cop shows. As well, the names of the two characters would be derived from two Burt Reynolds roles, Stroker Ace and Hooper. Gentlemen, I give you the ultimate expression of Southern pride. What? I am not gonna ride in that thing. It's perfect. It stands for everything I am against. Oh, shut up, Hoop. It's heritage. The heritage of slave owning. Well, you can just walk the Mississippi then. I've added a shotgun rack, a novelty horn. <laughs> Hell yeah! Tweety Bird pissing on the French flag. I've even added a tracking device in case car gets stolen now that he's pimped out. You're a genius, double wide. Oh, I almost forgot my finishing touch. A southern voice chip. Yeah. Let's go get them Yankees, son of a bitch. They also had a talking car named Car with two R's. Who, of course, is a more sarcastic parody of Kit from Knight Rider. Excuse me, miss. Hong Kong. Okay, great. I'm meeting some old friends who have my gas card, and I'm almost on E. Do you have any change? Maybe in your shoe. Uh, can I see your fuel gauge? Well, see, that's broken. 
If you give me your address, I can mail you the money later. <laughs> I can call your friends for you. They don't have phones. Sorry. Wait, miss! There's a sponge in my back seat. Could you just scrub my underside? Perverse? A whore? A whore? Did you just call me a whore? What am I gonna do? 2004 would also see the first show created by comedians Tim and Eric in the form of Tom Goes to the Mayor. Fish. <gasps> Crickets. Created by Tim Heidecker and Eric Eisman, the show was originally conceived as a web cartoon on the pair's personal website. The cartoon got so popular that it was able to get a sequel, which even attracted guest star David Cross. Because of this, Bob Odenkirk saw the potential of the show for something bigger, so he teamed with Adult Swim to produce the show for their block. The show uses a sub-animation style, using filtered pictures of the actors to make them look like crayon drawings, making the show incredibly quirky and cheap to make. The basic premise of the show is the main character, Tom, the sort of straight man for the show, interacting with the wacky mayor of the town and the town's weird goings-on. Adult Swim would go on to describe the show as its most polarizing, describing that people either loved or hated it. But despite this, it managed to get two seasons and opened the door to other shows from the duo down the line. The last original Adult Swim show for this year it's a bit of an odd one. Behold, Bamberger Necris. Okay. To carry around in honor. I put it, put it on your neck stock. My what? Head pole. My what? Head root, whatever. I, I'm not fine. To earn no. my respect, you must help my stupid bald nephew, Gerald. Find glory books. Perfect Hair Forever was one of the many attempts to parody the ever-growing anime medium, which had obviously gotten a large footprint on even the Adult Swim brand. The time slot it premiered was originally meant to show the pilot for another upcoming Adult Swim show, that being Squidbillies, but at the time, it was not ready to show yet, so the show was put in its place at the last minute, and in a typical Adult Swim fashion, they acted as if they played in an error. There was also a special Adult Swim Brain Trust special featuring early Kyler, star of the show that was supposed to air. And you, the green one. Early, do you have any comments about the movie we just watched? Well, don't you mean TV show? Whatever, it's all the same. Early, comments? Anything. Great. Okay, uh, who else on the panel? The show was created by some of the team behind Aqua Team which shows due to the show's random humor and limited animation, as well as some returning voices and even a Space Ghost cameo. Oh, there you go. <clears throat> now, wait a minute. <clears throat> Do y'all have any work for me? <laughs> Although it had many of the same elements as other such Adult Swim shows at the time, it never caught on and only lasted nine episodes. Speaking of anime, the Adult Swim action block was doing better than ever, with even more shows added, including Witch Hunter Robin, STNJ is in the business of hunting witches. Your powers are useless against me. Meet the team, a telepath, a hacker, a rookie, and a new girl. What? A master of witchcraft. Craft user. Business is booming. Oh, what did you do to my... Because you're a witch. Witch Hunter Robin, coming up next. Something supernatural. Adult Swim. Wolf's Reign.
Case Closed, the uber-popular kid detective show that's still airing to this day. When Tokyo police needed a crime solved, they turned to Jimmy Kudo, an inquisitive and popular young soccer ace with hopes of being the next Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Pretty big shoes to fill. But when the young detective is attacked after witnessing a crime, Jimmy discovers that the biggest shoes to fill might be his own. Forced to hide under the alias of six-year-old Conan Edogawa, Jimmy now looks to uncover the villains who drugged him. That, or leave it to the authorities. Get the cause of death? We're pretty sure it's the knife in his back, sir. Case Closed, premiering Monday, May 24th at 1230, Adult Swim. And two shows that would be big hits for the block. Full Metal Alchemist. If there's one man who can help, if there's one man who can help, it's a man coming in here right now. Ghost in the Shell, Standalone Complex. What happens when technology subsumes humanity? When humanity is no longer defined by being human? I believe you'll understand after you see this. The legendary cyberpunk classic finally comes to television in an all-new original series, Ghost in the Shell, Standalone Complex. Premiering Saturday, November 6th at 12.30. The future is now. The action block would also switch from the distorted bumpers that it had previously to more of a cool, smooth jazz style to really emphasize the adult aspect of the block and how cool it was. Two thousand four would also be the first year that Adult Swim would start its first of what would become a tradition of April Fool's joke nights. This year, all its programming for the night had little mustaches drawn on various characters in various shows. Michelle, baby, where are you going? It's not working out, Fry. I put your stuff out on the sidewalk. Hi, Laszlo. What you doing? Do you really want to know? Not really. Then let me tell you. I'm taking advantage of all of the things this place has to offer, like robots and wings. If your house needs a plank or your car has a ding, you can find it at Cartoon. If monsters need ice packs or nerds want a beaker, if your guitar is broken or it's time for new squeakers, if you need a good book or your kids are a stinker, you can find it at but where do I go if I want an afro? My silly friend Blue, here's what you should do. Just get on down to Cartoon! Wow! Where's that again? Cartoon? No, that's not it. 2005 brought a lot of new content to the channel with new and original shows across all three blocks. The year would kick off with even more changes to Fridays, which would include a new set, a new host in the form of Tara Sands, as well as a new intro, which was mostly like the previous one, but would replace certain characters with newer ones. That was Foster's home for imaginary friends, everyone. Any business for us, Tommy? Well, you have one more week of the Maguzi Make a Monster piece online. Go to Maguzi.com for more details because <laughs> they didn't give me any details about the details. So if you want to know about the details, just go to Maguzi.com. Uh, I can take that point. picture. <laughs> Sometimes I fall down. Cartoon Network could also run a summer special around this time, introducing and previewing new shows and episodes to the channel, 
the first of which was the life and times of Juniper Lee. The Life and Times of Juniper Lee was created by former Real World star Jude Winnick, who described the show as The Simpsons meets Buffy the Vampire Slayer. The show focused around Juniper Lee, a young girl who was able to see magical beings that normal humans can't see, due to a magic veil separating the worlds. She uses her special abilities and the help of her family and talking Scottish pug to help protect her hometown from evil. While short-lived, the show did manage three seasons, a few shorts, and even a few awards. It had a good mix of action and comedy to help compete with shows like Kim Possible and The American Dragon which were currently airing on Disney at the time. The next show to be added was Camp Laszlo. Attention campers, attention campers, it's time for Camp Laszlo. There were two scouts who made a friend and Laszlo was his name. Oh, L-A-Z-L-O. 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 Camp Laszlo was a timer. And then that trio went to camp and turned it upside down. The story set in a summer camp called Camp Kidney, populated with a variety of different campers and staff. Created by Joe Murray, who previously created the smash hit Rocco's Modern Life for Nickelodeon, the show centers on camper Laszlo and his bunkmates Raj and Clam. Can you read the sign? There's a shortage! I thought we made a jelly cabin pact! Jelly! How can you keep eating marshmallows when you gave your word? Like this. And like this. Give me those. I thought we were marshmallow buddies. What about the jelly cabin pack? Marshmallow buddies. Jelly cabin pack. Raj. Mm. Hey, what's that? Along with a host of other campers whose actions tend to annoy Scoutmaster Lumpus. Sir, there are a few things to go over. <laughs> You're supposed to be handing out the cleanest cabin award today. <laughs> That sounds awful. Who won? A uh, jelly cabin. Oh, they are the worst! They're right here, sir. Oh, I, of course they are. <laughs> Premiering later on in what is a small blip in history is Sunday Pants. Hey, what's new in Sunday Pants for the cartoon set? Dashing colors. Could you move, please? Wild design. Carefree styles for every move and for all shapes and sizes. It's one half hour of the best animated shorts in town. Damn it. And we didn't forget the accessories. Sunday Pants. Sunday Pants, starting tomorrow at 9.30 on Cartoon Network. Sunday Pants was a short anthology show that was made up of various shorts from many different sources. This includes shorts from overseas, pilots, college projects, and even original animation made for the show itself, tied together with live action segments featuring the band The Slacks. It was not necessarily meant to also create full new shows, but just a place to utilize pre-made content they already had access to to fill time slots. However, Sunday Pants was short-lived, only lasting one month, with many episodes either going unaired or scrapped entirely. A show that lasted longer, however, and like Camp Laszlo, captured the classic spirit of cartoon cartoons, was My Gym Partner's a Monkey. I used to go to a human school where everyone was the same. Now I go to an animal school because mine is my last name. My Gym Partner's a Monkey. Monkey, monkey, monkey. My Gym Partner's a Monkey. Monkey, monkey, monkey. Oh, sure, pretty, but I don't know what. Going to this school's a pain in the... Adam! What? I 
was gonna say next. Oh, that's okay then. My gym partner is a monkey. Monkey, monkey, monkey. My gym partner is a monkey. Monkey, monkey, monkey. My A slapstick comedy about a human boy with a last name Lion, who because of a clerical error, is transferred to an animal school. Adam Lion must now survive this new school, where he doesn't fit in, and in many cases, is not on the top of the food chain. But he's not alone. He has his titular monkey gym partner, Jake, voiced by Tom Kenny. Yep. Might I suggest a little color for those cheeks? Oops, what's that? As well as a pack of friends, including Windsor Gorilla. Sob, 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 sob. Uh, don't cry, Windsor. I'm not crying. I'm just saying sob over and over. Slips Python. Slowly losing my mind. <laughs> Slips, are you sick? Yes, no! Oh! Ingrid Giraffe. Ah, uh, it's a leaf. A fuchsia acacia leaf? Does any of that mean it's pink? Cause it's pink! Great pink leaf, Ingrid. Thanks for sharing. Ah, uh, I think I hear the bell. Me too. Yeah, me too. And Guadalupe Toucan. Lupe, what are you doing? I'm checking your ears. For goofy mites! They tend to thrive in high altitude, you know. You're clean! So I guess you're just crazy! The show had a great mix of slapstick and gross-out humor. It was even one of the few shows around this time to get its own TV movie. At some middle schools, the students have a tendency to behave like animals. But at Charles Darwin Middle School, the students really are animals. Except for the new kid. His name is Adam Lyon. Push him up, Adam. He's 12 years old, and he's now the only human student at a school for animals. You think you weren't school's a zoo? My gym partner's a monkey! My gym partner's a monkey. Two new episodes premiering February 24th, starting at 9 on Cartoon Network. The way it works is, you buy a ticket, then go in. My friends told me to meet him here, but the previews are starting. So? They won't know I'm here. We'll tell them. You sure? Yeah. We're just waiting for a, uh... Windfall? A bus. I thought we were. Oh. Thanks. Follow me. <laughs> Your tickets? Oh, we don't need tickets. We're Max Imaginary friends. You're imaginary? Right? Oh, oh, yeah. Imaginary. Yeah. Yeah. But I can see you. Well, you must have a great imagination. But I, I thought imaginary friends look crazy and freaky and, uh... Oh, go ahead. Come on, guys. <laughs> Did they show you their tickets? They're imaginary. They don't need tickets. Were you born yesterday? I don't know. Hi, we're Max Imaginary Friends. He should have Oh, you're tickets. imaginary. And you shouldn't feel this and this and this. I think he felt it. But the last original Cartoon Network show of this year would be the one that would have a lasting legacy on the device that latches onto his wrist like a watch. This is the Omnitrix and it gives Ben the ability to transform into different aliens depending on what is selected on the watch. He uses this new device to become a superhero, and travel around the country helping people and stopping villains. But he's soon tracked down by alien supervillain Vilgax, who is after the Omnitrix, even if he has to cut off Ben's hand to get it. Tsunami, 2005 would bring some lesser shows to fill time slots, like Dice, the first 77 episodes of Zatch Bell, Yu-Gi-Oh, and even the bizarre choice of Bobobo Bo 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 Bo. In a world of head shavers, one man stands up for the little hair. Bo Bo Bo! In an action show unlike any you've ever seen, Bo Bo Bo. He's a complicated man, but no one understands him but his woman. Actually, I don't think anyone understands him. Bo 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 Bo! Premier Saturday, October 1st at 10.30. It doesn't make sense! Only Toonami. The block would also pick up some other big names that would be a big part in both eras of Toonami. Here we go! 
Monkey D. Luffy wants to become king of the pirates. The only problem, he can't swim. But he's gathered a crew. And together, they'll seek the legendary treasure of Gold Roger. Things are gonna get a little strange along the way. Who is that rubber boy? One Piece. Premiere Saturday, April 23rd from 10 to 11 p.m. Don't let this straw hat fool you. Only to Tommy. One Piece originally started airing in Japan in 1999, based on the incredibly popular manga series of the same name by mangaka Oda. It was licensed in 2004 by 4Kids for the Fox Box TV block. 4Kids infamously made many edits and changes to the show, for things like content and violence. The dub would also bring the quite memorable opening theme, which was now written as what would become known as the pirate rap. Yo! Story goes, we find out by the treasure in the grand line. There's no doubt the pirate whose eye is on it, he'll sing. I'll be king of the pirates, I'm gonna be king. His name is Luffy, that's Monkey D. Luffy. King of the pirates, he's made a rubble. Yo ho ho, he took a bite of gum gum. Name's Zolo, he's just like a samurai and a L-A-D-Y, Nami's not shy. The pirate crew coming through, doing their thing with the king of the pirates. He's gonna be king. Dio, 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 a year later, the show and its dub would air on Toonami with the same edits and changes. Another anime to air on Toonami in 2005 would be the hit known as Naruto. Nenjutsu, the art of stealth and perseverance. To follow this path, one must be strong in mind, body, and spirit. Ready. But the way is treacherous. Some will succeed, some will fail. But only one will rule the school. Naruto, one hour premiere Saturday, September 10th at 9. No guts, no glory. Only Toonami. First airing in Japan in 2002, Naruto was an anime series based on the Shonen Jump manga of the same name, centering around a world of ninja and a specific ninja, the orphan Naruto, on his journey to become Hokage, or the leader of his village. The manga and anime series had a bit of an explosion in the mainstream taking a place as a sort of new replacement for Dragon Ball Z, meaning it would also get a slew of merch for it, including video games, card games, and even new toys. Compete like a ninja! Zabuza sword cannot be beat! Huh. My turn! Shark and shooter! Transform! Launch! Direct hit! Victory is mine! Naruto Shark and Shooters, Abasa Sword and Leak Headband Accessories, each told seven. Toonami would also roll out its first original anime series from production IG. IG PX. In the year 2038, one sport is played the world over, where giant robots with human pilots battle in the ultimate test of human endurance. One, nine, three, take it in. These guys are all over me. Six robots, two teams, one victor. It is called the Immortal Grand Prix. This year, an amateur team will shock the world and change the way the game is played. Here we go! Because in the IG1 Grand Prix, winning is everything. Cartoon Network is proud to present a Toonami original five-part micro-series, IGPX, premiering September 15th at 6.30, right before new Dragon Balls. Only Toonami. IGPX started originally as a micro-series of five five-minute episodes back in 2003 that acted as a sort of pilot. The original series was a sort of battle royale competition of three robot teams 
who battled against each other for supremacy. Because of it being just a micro-series, the original plot was never resolved. When a full series was commissioned in 2005, the premise changed to a sort of mix of racing and roller derby, with mechs. In the year 2049, the world's most popular motorsport is the Immortal Grand Prix. Takashi Shin could be its greatest pilot ever, if he can just get over being a teenager. This season, Takashi and Team Satomi hit the big leagues on a quest to take the crown. The only thing standing in their way? 180 miles of track and five teams determined to win. All at 350 miles an hour. They wouldn't have it any other way. Cartoon Network is proud to present the first Toonami original series in a special one-hour premiere, IGPX. The race begins Saturday, November 5th at 10. Only Toonami. 2005 would also see a good number of original shows coming to Adult Swim. Some that were pretty controversial, the first of which being a little show called Minority. Minority! Last time I checked, we are superheroes! Dr. Wang, Jukano, El Jefe, Nonstop, and Pasto. Yo, crackers! Get em, boy! Minority! Fighting for all people of color except white people. What the hell? Unless they're Jewish. You want to get this party starting right? Minority team. Next Sunday at midnight on Adult Swim. I'm going to catch you on the flip side, you racist devil son of a bitch. Created by Adam De La Pena, who would also go on to create Code Monkeys the following year for G4, Minority Team is a parody superhero show, taking inspiration from the older liquid animation style Marvel shows with a bit of inspiration from the artwork of Jack Kirby. We must get to the lab. Fool! Pike out no game! Pike out epic struggle! Man against random odds! As many variables as grains of sand or drops of water in ocean! The twist here is that it followed a team of superheroes based on stereotypes. Dr. Wang, the super smart leader of the team, El Jefe, a Mexican hero who fights with a leaf blower, Fasto, the fastest man who ever was, Jukano, and Nonstop, an Indian convenience store owner who is immune to bullets. Excuse, please. We are running late for flight. Thank you so much. What are you all staring at? You've never seen an Indian man in all of his glory? Oops. Forgot to change back to my normal identity. Ha 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 ha. Uh, excuse me, sir. Yes? We're doing some additional security screenings and you've been randomly selected because of how you look. They would also fight many threats to minorities, mainly the White Shadow organization, led by White Shadow. That laser yacht was awesome! We should take that out later, I have a mixtape that is perfect for recreational boating. Silence, Mr. Shadow. Uh -oh. Silence, Steven Skullbird! Let's discuss $3,000 for powdered rhino horn. Oh, that must, um, stammer, uh, be some sort of mistake. And included villains like Racist Frankenstein and the Corporate Ladder. Racist Frankenstein, bring the M16s! Super powerful gun! Yeah, hang on, man, this is a crazy new gun, man! Kill him, boys! While controversial even at the time, it lasted a full 19 episodes before quietly being relegated to the website, never to be mentioned again. In the strange and backward universe known as Mirror World, where are we? Welcome, good friends, to the Mirror World, where everything is backwards. If everything is backwards, how come you ain't talking backwards? Because, well, I silence. Next up would be the much more surreal show, more in line with previous Adult Swim outings. Oh. 
Created by Aqua Teen creator Matt Mirelio, 12 Ounce Mouse is a fever trip of a show about a mouse assassin who goes on various disconnected adventures. More like Aqua Teen and many other popular shows, it relies on limited animation and oddball quirky humor. Oh, come on, baby. Man power go. <laughs> Next for the block is Lucy, the Daughter of the Devil. On Adult Swim Sunday Special, a very special Lucy, the Daughter of the Devil. Man, I just want to say sorry about calling so late last night. Mm -hmm. But I drank four uh, apple teenies. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I can't really talk right now. But you ever had one there? Because they're delicious. Wrong! <laughs> No. Fresh apple. No. Apple vodka. No. Apple schnapps. No. Celebrate specialness with Lucy, the daughter of the devil. Sunday at 11.45 on Adult Swim. Created by Lauren Bochard, previous creator of home movies, the show centers around Lucy, daughter of the devil, as her just trying to live a normal life while her father attempts to bring on the apocalypse. All the while, she's being hunted by a team of special clergy out to destroy the Antichrist and falls in love with the second coming of Jesus Christ, who turns out to be a DJ. The show would feature many voice talents that had previously worked with Lauren on home movies and with him on future projects, including H. John Benjamin, Sam Cedar, Melissa Barden, and Eugene Meerman. Previously teased, but finally premiering, was the southern parody known as Squidbillies. Created by Aqua Teen creator David Willis and Brack Show alum David Fortier, Squidbillies revolves around a family of Appalachian mud squids living in the backwoods of the South. I bought you a veggie game. You did? Hell no. Wash them trucks, but you leave the boat to me. Don't you touch that sunbitchin' boat. The boat is not a toy. Thank you. The boat is mine. The boat is mine! The family consists of early Kyler, an alcoholic, violent, bigoted redneck, essentially every stereotype of Southerners rolled into one. Where do I see myself in five beers? Years. Uh, years? I don't know. Jail? Well... Don't say jail. Prison. Well, hell, how hard could it be? It ain't brain surgery. Uh, it is brain surgery. <laughs> I got a knife. Where's the brain at? Early. And how hard could this be? Hell, it ain't rock. Let's just go. Granny, a senile squid who always seems to be on the brink of death, but never seems to cross it. I'll tell you something, and I'll say it right now with my mouth, and it needs to be listened to. Why, it's just too reflective with the shiny skin beating sunlight into my eyes. Rusty Kyler, the son of Early, and a naive squid, trying to make the most out of his poor family life. Hey, how y'all doing? <laughs> and a seldom mentioned Lil, the meth-making sister of the family. I lift up your shirt, woman. Hey, oh, she ain't wore a shirt since 89. What do you think he's wore? A big old floppy chin? <laughs> I get that sometimes. While being mostly stereotypes and offensive humor, it did manage to make a good connection with the country music scene including not only many band cameos in the show, but after a few seasons, the opening theme would be covered by many bands and artists every episode. My dreams were all dead and buried. Sometimes I wish the sun would just explode. Just explode. When God comes and calls me to his kingdom, I'll take out you polka people when I go. When I go. Adult Swim would also get into claymation with the religious parody, Moral Oral.
created by Dino Stenophilus, Moro Oral is a parody of the Davy and Goliath series of Christian claymation shorts. Moro Oral takes a more cynical look at fundamentalism, while still showing it through the naive eyes of the show's protagonist, Oral. While the first season stuck to the parody format, including a lesson for Oral at the end of each episode, as the show went on, it got a bit more disjointed and darker, focusing more on the other residents of the town and less on Oral himself. But through it all, they endure. Selling crack is a lucrative business right now. People love it. Because they're a family. Wow. Moral Oral, next Sunday at midnight on Adult Swim. Continuing with the stop motion was Robot Chicken. Robot Chicken is a stop-motion sketch comedy show created by star of Idle Hands and Greg the Bunny, Seth Green, as well as co-creator Matthew Seinrich, who previously worked on toy magazine Toy Fair. The show itself was inspired by Toy Fair magazine, as it would have comics featuring action figures in various comedic situations. Both Seth and Matthew would collaborate together on various projects, including a stop-motion sketch on Late Night with Conan O'Brien, featuring a stop-motion toy, Conan. It's me, Conan! Oh my god, Conan O'Brien! I love your show! Do you want to make out with me? Okay! That'd be great! You can be my boyfriend and we can live together in Florida and you can take me to school and help me learn to drive and boat and stuff. Okay. Because I love you. We're like Romeo and Juliet without all the family. I would totally die for you, Conan. Can we just make out? Don't toy with me, Conan. I kill you so fast. I, I just wanted to meet you. I loved you. Now I have to divorce you and get an abortion. <gasps> the two would later try to pitch the show concept to various places, including Comedy Central, Mad TV, SNL, and even Cartoon Network themselves. It was only when these pitch videos made its way to Adult Swim, and when Family Guy creator Seth MacFarlane, who was working with Seth on Family Guy, told them to pitch it to the block. The rest, as they say, is history with the show still a fixture on the block, overtaking Aqua Teen as the longest running series in the block's history. But the last show to premiere on Adult Swim would prove to be one of its biggest hits. I am the stone that the builder refused. I am the visual, the inspiration that made ladies sing the blues. I'm the spark that makes your idea bright. The same spark that lights the dark so that you can know your left from your right. I am the ballad in your box, the bullet in the gun, the inner glow that let you know to call your brother son. The story that just begun, the promise of what's to come. And I'm going to remain a soldier till the war is won. Chop, chop, chop. Boondocks, based on the 1999 comic strip of the same name and adapted for Adult Swim by its creator, Aaron McGruder, the Boondocks is the story of brothers Huey and Riley Freeman, who have moved into a better neighborhood with their granddad. Now we're going to this party and your black asses are going to behave. If I'm lucky, I'll find myself a nice white woman with a flat booty who will listen to my problems. Aaron had been pitching a TV show for the Boondocks for as long as he had been pushing for newspaper syndication for his comic. He had also created a pilot for Fox, but had difficulty making the show acceptable for network standards. Eventually, Mike Lazo stumbled upon the pilot and described it as too networky. He ordered 15 episodes of the Boondocks for Adult Swim, and told Aaron to just tell stories, and the rest is history. Sunday on the Boondocks. Sunday, 11 p.m., Adult Swim. Boondocks became an instant hit for the block, 
and seemed to be a series made for Adult Swim structure. Not only because of its controversial nature, being a show that opted to take a different look at politics in order to tell stories. Oh, Jesus! It was terrible! I was in the club, and I was in the club, and this bitch stepped on my shoe, and I was like, bitch! Including one of its early episodes about the R. Kelly trial and his defense among the black community. We all know the nigga can sing, but what happened to standards? What happened to bare minimums? You a fan of R. Kelly? You want to help R. Kelly? Then get some counseling for R. Kelly. Introduce him to some older women. Hide his camcorder. But don't pretend like the man is a hero. As well as a what if episode about Martin Luther King Jr. awaking from a coma and seeing the present his civil rights movement created. A political party. Not just any political party. A black revolutionary political party. But why me? You should ask Oprah to do it. She's more popular than, if you ask me, a darn pretty lady. Oh, snap. No, they didn't. A boneless rib sandwich. What will they think of next? I know I shouldn't eat these, but they're for a limited time only. <sighs> I really should have approvals over this kind of thing. But also Eren's clear and open inspiration from anime in the series, especially in the fight scenes. He would credit Cowboy Bebop and Samurai Champloo, two series that would later air on the Adult Swim block, as big inspirations to him. What? What? You thought you was the only one who mastered the ancient and deadly art of the Nunchaku? Along with its controversial nature, the series was filled with guest stars and known voice actors. Huey and Riley Freeman were both played by Regina King of Friday and Boys in the Hood fame. Damn, Morpheus, what you about to do? I love you, man. Ugh, nigga, you gay. Granddad, or Robert Freeman, is played by the late great John Witherspoon. My boys have to grow up to be big and strong. I'm eating this bowl of Cheerios because you know what? The cholesterol's not gonna lower itself. Mm. Other voice actors and guest stars include Gary Anthony Williams as the fan favorite Uncle Ruckus. Just wait till I get me another brick or maybe a large rock or you know one of them teeny tiny little cement blocks. Why'd you have to go mess with the natural order of things? I'd have shocked you myself. But I realized the white man got better aim. Ed Asner is Ed Wensler Sr. Excuse me, gentlemen. Would you like to sign our petition to get more humane treatment for immigrant workers? If you don't get that bullshit out of my face, bitch. Charlie Murphy is Ed Wensler Jr. <laughs> Fuck y'all looking at. And even Samuel L. Jackson. Well, no, we ain't fine. But I always say the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. What? Simply because you don't have evidence that something does exist does not mean that you have evidence that something doesn't exist. What? What country you from? What? What ain't no country I ever heard of. They speak English in what? What? English, motherfucker, do you speak it? Needless to say, Boondocks was a powerhouse in many ways, and one that more than made the case for itself for the network. However, after its three successful seasons, Adult Swim and Aaron would not come to any sort of agreement on a production schedule, and therefore he did not return for the show's fourth and final season. Crest forever. What's going on? <laughs> We're broke, aren't we, Granddad? I refinanced with that damn adjustable rate mortgage. How much? A couple. <laughs> Thousand? <laughs> you got my money, right? I'm working on it, but I don't have the money right now. Isn't there anyone who can help this man? <gasps> Morning. You might have to get a job, Granddad. Now you better grab some suds and start waxing hood. We're dressed like slaves. We are slaves, Granddad. How do you feel about whores, Robert? Love them. Good. Granddad, hoeing? 
I'm escorting ladies. Oh, God, I've been so lonely. Yes. I brought a friend over. Still here, and you still a bitch. <laughs> I love this guy. I'm waking up, new shoes, new socks, two blocks, TV, locked on boondock, boondock. You know it's straight wildin' like Riley. I got a young wild inside me. I'm gonna stand in the middle of the road in my drawers with this gun, and I'm gonna go out like a jail. Granddad! We think to bring no guns. How can something like this happen to us? Stuff like this happens to us all the time, Granddad. The Boondocks new season starts Monday, April 21st at 10 30. Act like you know. God bless America. We need to burn this place down. Adult Swim. Along with these original programs, Adult Swim would continue to air some of the best anime in 2005. This would include Neon Genesis Evangelion which previously aired on Cartoon Network, but now was able to stretch its legs on the later block. The angels have returned. Unit 1 is beginning. One sequence. Releasing primary Mankind time. has no time. Scryed. Paranoia Agent. Samurai Shampoo. Ghost in the Shell, second gig. They would also have the one-time showing of an anime horror short, Kakurenbo, Hide and Seek, on Halloween of that year. Otokoyo is a secret game. It's a game of hide and seek. Kids will disappear. <laughs> Professor, do you have car trouble? Oh, it seems I've locked my keys in the car. That is serious. Jeez! Well, I... Is there a problem, Professor? Oh, hello, number one. I seem to have locked myself out of my car. And now he is out of cheese. <gasps> Crackers! 
I'll need some two by fours. I'll be right back. Bring more cheese. Hey, it's no problem. I'll just call my auto club. <laughs> How many geniuses does it take to unlock a car door? <laughs> Did you try the door? <laughs> Silly me. Uh, thanks, Mandy. Whatever. Right. But does anyone have some nails? 2006 would be a bit of an odd time for Cartoon Network, at least in regards to bumpers. While the CN City bumpers would still be played, and new ones were still being produced to highlight other shows on the network, we would also see the rise of one of the shortest eras in Cartoon Network history, the Yes Era which would be born from the airing of two particular episodes of Foster's Home and Billy and Mandy. I like music. I do. I like, I like music that goes like, la 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 Yes. The 2005 episode of Foster's titled Mac Daddy introduced Cheese, an imaginary friend with a love of chocolate milk. Can I help you? I like chocolate milk. Yes, I caught that before. Can I have some chocolate milk? Why do I look like your mother? The 2006 episode of The Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy, Keeper of the Reaper, saw the first appearance of Fred Fredberger, who acts as a juror in a custody battle, Billy and Mandy, for Grim. I'm hungry. Judge? Yes, uh, where are the nachos? There aren't any nachos. Well then, uh, where are the hot dogs? There are no hot dogs. Pizza? No! Tacos? I like tacos! Don't encourage him! And his non-sequitur jokes and attitude made him an instant hit on a still early internet. So much so, they based a whole era after him. The Yes era would include bumpers that would show modified clips of Fred Fredberger, along with other random clips, and would end with a Cartoon Network Yes. <laughs> I'm a woodpecker! Except with dirt. Cartoon Network. Yes! 2006 would not bring much in the way of new shows to Cartoon Network proper. But we did see the seldom remembered Squirrel Boy. Created by the late great Everett Peck, who also created Duck Band for USA. USA? Are they on at night? Are you kidding? Dozens of people watch USA. About a squirrel boy named Rodney who ropes his human friend Andy into different get-rich-quick schemes. Just taking my mouth on an all-expense-paid trip to Delisville! Andy, is now the time when I should bring up your little quirks? What little quirks? What are you doing here? Just touching all the light switches in the house before bed. Good night! During our show, Squirrel Boy, we like to wear funny hats. I got a head made out of bird! Uh, it's funnier if you actually put it on. Oh, brother. I can't help it if your hat wearing lacks that certain comedy gold. Basically, we are a snack-eating, funny hat-wearing, quirky pair of thing breakers. What could be better? So what, Squirrel Boy? Uh, Squirrel Boy. July 14th on Cartoon Network. Should we go break something? Let's put on some funny hats first. And have a snack! We also saw the airing of a very unique show that took advantage of blending animation and music, Class of 3000. In a meeting with Thomas Lynch and Mike Lazo to pitch possible show ideas, they discovered they both had a love of Outcast. So the two decided to pitch Andre 3000 on a possible adaptation of his album, The Love Below. But Andre initially rejected the idea and wanted to instead go for something more original. Not wanting to create another Hammerman, Andre wanted to fully involve himself in its development. Andre and Lazo took a trip to Andre's hometown of Atlanta, where he told his stories of his childhood. And Class of 3000 was born. The show had a lot of influence from Andre, the different characters being based on ones from his childhood, and the different songs being written and performed by and with him. 
The show did manage to get two full seasons, but ran into trouble due to high production costs and the scheduling issues with Andre getting different songs to production on time. Later tonight, Tsunami's Double Dippin'. Zatch Bell's all new at 8 and 8.30. Zatch and Keel get closer to harnessing the power of the spellbook, but for now, the sixth one will do. Then it's on to new One Pieces at 9 and 9.30. Luffy and Trace are double trouble against Baroque Works, but the crew's still learning how bad Baroque can be. It's all this and more on Toonami, later tonight from 7 to 11. Only on Cartoon Network. Toonami in 2006 did not have a lot going for it. Most of the newer shows for the block actually aired on its online streaming site, Toonami Jetstream, such as Mar, Prince of Tennis, and Ikaru no Go. Hey Toonami faithful, it's your old pal Tom. I'm here to tell you about Toonami Jetstream, your online source for the finest anime and action cartoons on the net. We've got cult faves like Samurai Jack and Megas XL Awesome. Plus, the best ninja show around, Naruto. And that's not all. Never before seen shows like Mare, The Prince of Tennis, and Karu no Go. Get started at TsunamiJetStream.com. Go with the flow. They would also air some Pokemon series and the Yu-Gi-Oh! sequel series, Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. The only new series to air on Toonami Block was Wulong Warriors, a Taiwanese puppet series that aired two episodes on the block and was quickly canceled. Trained from an early age, these swordsmen are Wulin's greatest warriors. Now, they must defeat one of their own to save Wulin from destruction. Wulin Warriors, Saturday, February 4th at 8 p.m. Only Toonami on Cartoon Network. But the last year of this era of Toonami would bring something a little different. Man Against Nature. The insects must be stopped. Spirits Against Humans. You should be here. Get out of here. Go! Man Against Man. Hold it right there! And the most fantastic visuals around. Let's go! Spirited Away. I'm dreaming, I'm dreaming! Princess Mononoke. This is what hatred looks like! Castle in the Sky. That was exciting. Nausicaa of the Valley of the Wind. You must not burn down the toxic jungle! Finish what you started, human! Fire! Toonami is proud to present four of the greatest animated movies ever made. This is unbelievable! A month of Miyazaki, starting March 18th at 7.30. Don't sleep on it. We're doing this for the good of the planet. Only Toonami on Cartoon Network. Toonami would present the month of Miyazaki, a month of time where several Hayao Miyazaki films were aired on the block. The movies in question were Spirited Away, Castle in the Sky, Princess Mononoke, and Nausicaa Valley of the Wind. The forest. It's some kind of demon. Once benevolent gods have become wrathful and destructive. <laughs> Prince Ashitaka has been driven from his home by this evil. He's obviously an outsider. Now he must slow this hatred while battling a demon within. It's eating me alive, and very soon now it will kill me. The only ones who can help him are two women sworn to kill each other. No. That woman is evil. Open fire. What I want is for the humans of the forest to live in peace. Princess Mononoke, Saturday night at 7.30. This is unbelievable. Part of a month of Miyazaki. See with eyes unclouded by hate. Only Toonami on Cartoon Network. Adult Swim has not aired a new Aqua Teen episode for more than a year. Why? It's called supply and demand. By limiting supply, we increase demand. The government does this with the farmers. They pay farmers to burn their cows, creating a need for more cows. The fact is, new Aqua Teen episodes were produced, but we're not going to air them. That would decrease demand, which is why we're going to air them. After all, we're not the government. We're Adult Swim. On the Adult Swim front, they were still continuing to create new shows and air some of the best. On the original series front, we had Assy McGee, a parody of buddy cop shows about an anthropomorphic but created by Matt Harrigan, who had worked on previous Adult Swim projects. Hello? Is John Adams there? Yeah, speaking. How does it feel to kill a hooker, John? What? I said, how does it feel to kill a hooker? It's four in the morning. 
Who is this? Did you kill the hooker? No. Oh. Another often overlooked show, yet an important one for the history of not just Adult Swim, but of a certain other program on FX, is Frisky Dingo. Now that Awesome X has defeated all the supervillains in the city, okay. it's time Xander Cruz got focused. Xander Cruz. Oh. You're Awesome X. Awesome uh. X, yes. Maybe read a newspaper once in your life. Screw it, shoot it. Bring it, you cyborg sons of bitches! Come on, start up, man. You ain't gonna die. Say the freaking word. <laughs> Created by Adam Reed and Matt Thompson, who worked together on C-Lab 2021, Frisky Dingo was the story of the Warren Kelly. The whereabouts of the villain kill face. Did I say the villabouts of the Warren Kelly? Yeah. Because I've been doing that a lot lately. I wonder if it's a tumor. And his plan to build a device to push the Earth into the sun. But he has a bit of a hard time marketing it. <laughs> Good girl. What's our unit price on this? What, in including postage? Well, unless you propose having the stork plop them down the chimney. Well, you know who I like is that pickle stork that they had from the pickles. It's a mailman. No, never mind. What's the unit price? 380. 380? Well, you are the one that wanted animated menus, so. What? How much without animated menus? I don't know, less. Out to stop him, as well as license his likeness for toys, is billionaire playboy Xander Cruz, otherwise known as the hero Awesome X, who fights crime with the super fighting force, the Exticles. Oh! All right, pause, pause it right there. That's Cruz smashing Ronnie's nuts. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, come on! <laughs> Guys, come on! Are you kidding me? These tapes are supposed to be a learning tool. Oh, man. What'd Ronnie do wrong here? He, um, took off his robot pants? Keen-eyed viewers will remember the clear and obvious connection to the previous C-Lab 2021 and the creator's future project, Archer, which is still airing as of the time of this writing. It's a show that relies on snappy dialogue, long-running jokes, and memorable characters. Frisky Dingo would unfortunately only last two seasons, leaving on a cliffhanger. But some could make the case that if Frisky Dingo had not ended, we would never have gotten Archer. But it would be nice to see an ending to the story someday. But the last original show of this year would be one of its most memorable and most unique. was co-created by Brendan Small, who previously worked with Adult Swim on home movies, and Tommy Blancha. The show focused on the metal band Death Clock, who are the most popular band in the world. But while they are incredible musicians, they're also idiots. Oh, what's this place called? This is, I believe, it's called Food Libraries. Food, food, food Libraries. Library. It's called Lib the grocery store, you douchebags! I'm sorry about douchebags. I got, got low blood sugar who, with their incredible power and money, managed to get into crazy situations, including summoning Finnish lake trolls. Well, it's official. Finland is being destroyed by a troll that you summoned. Well, I'm not sorry. <laughs> I can't believe we summoned a troll. Why didn't we think of this earlier? This power is closely monitored by a shadowy organization who see Death Clock as part of that ancient prophecy that will bring about the Metalocalypse. Now's the time to take out Death Clock once and for all. You're just sitting there underwater. We can make it look like an underwater accident. No! It is too soon. We must watch them. The show was a labor of love for creator Brendan Small, who not only wrote the show and voiced several of the main characters, that being Nathan Explosion, Pickles, and Squizgar Squigolf, but also wrote the music for the show which would also be released in three Death albums. He even still tours to this day at festivals and plays Death Clock songs with his band. Fuck 
Adult Swim had added a few more anime to its lineup, including the popular Bleach and Trinity 7. However, one show would prove to be an interesting addition. Shin-chan, known as Crayon Shin-chan in Japan, started as a comedy manga in 1990 and quickly became a hit anime in 1992, currently still airing with over 1,000 episodes and 30 movies. Shin Chan would previously be adapted to the West before, in the form of the Vitello dub in the early 2000s. This version of the show never aired in the US despite being produced in a studio in California. It was only aired in Fox Kids and later Jetix in the UK, as well as Australia and Ireland. I'm writing letters. Oh. <laughs> Friendships are important, Shin. We need to keep in touch with the people we care about. It shows they're appreciated. That's deep. I bet there's someone you appreciate. Someone who cooks your meals, cleans your clothes, and loves her little boy very, very much. Anyone spring to mind? Not really. Okay. While it would be a full series, eventually the show would be changed to just shorts that would air during commercial breaks and in between other shows. A few years later, another dub of Shin Chan would be tried, this time produced not only for Europe, but by a European studio as well. And most episodes of both were seen as lost media until very recently, when many episodes were found and uploaded online, it being the only way to watch this dub as of now. Miss Hishi! Tell your mom I want to see her, okay? She doesn't let strange men in the house. <laughs> I'm not a man, I'm a lady, just like your mom. Hey! Watch that talk! My mom's no lady! Both dubs would stay fairly accurate to the original source, other than Americanizing the names and adding new background music. Shin Chan being known for somewhat relative raunchy humor, this is also mostly kept intact, including Shin's signature move of showing his butt and doing a little dance. But some episodes that focus more specifically on sexual content and jokes were skipped entirely. However, this wouldn't be a problem for the next time Shin Chan would be adapted to the West. He is the big head boy, Shin Chan. Very famous in the world for his popular TV program, Shin Chan. Mama! Many are loving him, also adults. No. Uh -huh. Includes ladies and gentlemen. Shin Chan, sausage eater, showing his pat pat to everyone. Meow. Hot damn! See Shin Chan on the Adult Swim TV for you. Okay. Shin Chan showing his pat pat to everyone. Shin Chan. Monday into Thursday, 12.30, Adult Swim TV. In 2005, Funimation would require the licensing rights to Shin Chan, and it would go in a bit of a different direction. Uh, From Action Foods, if you don't buy it, you'll die! You want 10 sausages? Yeah, I need them! A child psychology book I read warned me about this. Unlike previous dubs, which would make changes but stick pretty close to the source, Funimation would opt to Americanize it even more. This would include name changes, adding even more dark elements, pop culture and political jokes, and even changing entire characters' personality and backstories. Some jokes would be related to current American politics and would push the limits of humor for the era, joking about terrorism, domestic abuse, Jews, and one character who would have his personality changed completely as a parody of modern conservatism. While the dub was successful enough to produce three seasons and 78 episodes, the show is currently not available to watch legally, the DVDs having never gotten a reprint, and the episodes not available to stream on Funimation's service or the new Crunchyroll when the two companies merged. The dub is still popular nowadays, still being referenced and discovered by anime fans new and old. However, 
Crunchyroll has never acknowledged the dub or made attempts to revive it, possibly due to the content not aging well in their eyes. Hima, he's old enough to be your stepfather. Not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> no, Hima, his don't squirt milk no matter how hard you squeeze. <laughs> Nice ride. Uh, thanks. What do you think of my van? I call it my mystery machine. Pretty cool, huh? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Customizer myself. Wall-to-wall -wall shed, four speakers, the works. The works, huh? <laughs> You're my kind of guy. Hey, what do you got there, a V8? V8000. Ooh, hey. It's kind of like a monster truck. M -m 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 monster truck? Cut it out, Scoob. You're ruining my street cred. Whoa. Sorry. Hey, guys. Groovy ride. Want a lift? Hey! Okay, dude. Let's see what that jalopy can do. What's a jalopy? <laughs> First off the line. Yeah. I'm sure they're feeling pretty silly right now. 2007 would see some real changes to the network in several ways. While many aspects of the network would stay, like shows that would continue their runs like Ed, Ed and Eddie, there would be many other changes to long-running aspects. But the year would start for Cartoon Network with a huge scare that would cause ripples in the network for years to come. It was just a publicity stunt for a TV cartoon show, but the discovery of nine suspicious electronic devices triggered a giant scare across the city of Boston today. Eyewitness News reporter Rob Hayes is live in Burbank to tell us what those devices turned out to be. Rob? Well, Michelle, the folks here at Cartoon Network, or more specifically Turner Broadcasting, which owns Cartoon Network, they have a lot of explaining to do. What was supposed to be a marketing stunt is now being blamed for that terrorist scare in Boston. On January 31st of 2007, supposed suspicious devices were found in various areas around Boston. Reported as IEDs, the devices were later identified as essentially bootleg light brights, displaying the characters of Ignignog and Ur, the Moonanites of the popular Aqua Teen Hunger Force franchise. Two men were soon arrested for planting the devices, artists Peter Badowski and Sean Stevens. They were hired by Adult Swim to plant the signs as part of a nationwide guerrilla marketing campaign to promote the release of Aqua Teen Hunger Force colon movie film for theaters, which was releasing this same year. The story was covered by many major outlets, most criticizing Adult Swim, Cartoon Network, and its parent companies for pushing a stunt like this, with the memory of 9-11 still very fresh in people's minds. Fans, however, knew that this was all very overblown. The two men were charged, but they did not take the charges seriously. At a press conference, they opted not to talk about the case in question and instead spoke about haircuts of the 60s. For, for, hold on a second, hold on a second. Uh, for example, Afro, I think, comes kind of from the 70s. But then again, there's other styles, like the greased up hair, when they actually use grease. And I'm not totally sure where that comes from. Whether or not it's from the 20s or from the... It's definitely not from the 60s, I don't think. Well, but, <clears throat> the 60s sort of... We're taking this very seriously. Yeah, please um, don't interrupt. The, the 60s sort of had their the mod hairstyle, which I believe um, evolved into the sort of greased back look of the 70s. But Peter, what you're saying is you yeah, think it maybe saying. came more from the 20s? Yeah. But there were consequences. Turner set it out of court by paying $2 million, a million of which went to the Boston PD for damages. As well, at the time, general manager of Cartoon Network, Jim Samples, resigned as a direct result of this incident. He was replaced by Stuart Snyder, who would remain at the position until 2014. While this change was happening, another major change would happen to the network, including the end of a fairly long-time fixture. Fridays would have its final airing on February 23, 2007, and would be replaced quickly by Friday Night Premiere Thunder, a motocross-themed block which would do the job of showing new premiere cartoons on Fridays without having to film sets or skits. This would turn out to be just a temporary replacement, however, as it was quickly replaced by Fried Dynamite, a show block that would be themed around a group of kids doing wacky skits and showing more of the Cartoon Network Studios as a sort of reality TV hook. As for shows, we got the network's first live action series on Cartoon Network since 1996. Let's see if you can tell what's wrong with this picture. Let's see from planet attitude is my sister. My mom could help, but she's in space at the moment. That isn't qualified to counsel a donut. Bam, I didn't see that train. Now I've got cartoons coming out of my brain. No one can see them, so it's hard to explain it. I'll keep 
my head when there's a freak trying to claim it. Till then, if I can make some new friends and not go off the deep end, I'm glad I'm out of my head. Out of Jimmy's Head was a spin-off series based on the Cartoon Network original movie, Reanimated, which aired the previous year. The show focused on a boy named Jimmy, who, after an accident, has a brain transfer performed on him. The brain he receives happens to be that of a famous cartoonist. After the procedure, Jimmy finds that he can now see the cartoon creations of said cartoonist, but no one else can. These characters sometimes help Jimmy with his problems, or more likely than not, cause problems. Out of Jimmy's Head was a very standard live-action sitcom, one you may see on Nickelodeon or Disney at the time, although it only lasted one 20-episode season. Back on the Cartoon Network front, we would see the creation one of the most well-known cartoons of the era, before certain changes were made. You take the moon and you take the sun. You take everything that seems like fun. You stir it all up and then you're done. Rada, 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 rada. So come on in, feel free to do some looking. Stay a while, cause something's always cooking. Come on in, feel free to do some looking. Stay a while, cause something's always cooking. Yeah! Oh, yeah. Created by previous storyboard artist of Billy and Mandy and voice of Fred Fredberger, C.J. Greenblatt, Chowder is a story of a young boy apprenticing to become a chef. He's studying under Mung Dahl, who works as a sort of restaurant-slash-catering company, with his wife Truffles and employee Schnitzel. <laughs> oh, don't sneak up on me like that! How do you want me to sneak up on you? Like this? <laughs> Chowder had a creative mix of styles, being not just 2D animated, it also incorporated puppets, claymation, and even live action segments. It also had a knack for breaking the fourth wall, like in one of my many favorite jokes of the series. I'm gonna be making a few changes starting now! You! You're gonna be taking the ball! You, you, and you are ugly! So, you're gonna play defense! Got it? Good! Now, break! Yes, that's very funny! I hate this show. Chowder was an insanely creative project that creator C.J. Greenblatt was working on close to seven years before it actually aired. The care and heart are clearly all over it. Get away from me! Father! Chowder, calm down. The dentist is all done with you. Yeah, but he still hasn't got the bear! <laughs> Another big show for the network at the time was the latest addition to the Transformers universe. Got a little surprise for you, son. No, 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 Dad! Oh, you gotta be kidding me. Yeah, I am. You're not getting a Porsche. 2007 would see the premiere of the first Transformers live action movie from infamous director Michael Bay. And while many fans have mixed feelings about the admittedly successful film franchise, it did allow for more exposure to do other things with the series, including Transformers Animated. Produced by Cartoon Network Studios and premiering the day after Christmas, Transformers Animated switches up the story a bit from the original canon. In this continuity, the war for Cybertron has ended, and we see a crew of familiar Autobots, including Optimus Prime, discovering the fabled Allspark. After being attacked by Decepticons, the group is forced to make a crash landing on Earth, where they must remain in stasis for half a century to survive. When they awaken in the year 2050, they are greeted by a new human companion, Sari, and together work to protect the Allspark from the returning Decepticons. Transformers Animated managed to combine the perfect mix of great animation, storytelling, and humor, not to mention an all-star cast. And of course, like most Transformers, the toy line was one of the best. It's a series all Transformers fans still hold a deep love for. We would also see another movie premiering in 2007 that being Ben 10 Race Against Time, the first in what would turn out to be two live-action movies. Ben 
Jim Tennyson has always been special. You might call him a superhero. Let's ruffle. But in the quiet town of Bellwood, being a hero doesn't exactly help with girls or bullies or homework. He... And when an ancient enemy is freed from his prison, he'll fight his toughest battle yet. There is nowhere you can run. A monster named Eon. And this time, nothing shall fall to me once Benjamin Tennyson is dead. Race Against Time would be an adventure set in what would later turn out to be an alternate universe, separate from the main show. I would see Ben battle against a time-traveling alien named Eon. The movie had mixed reactions from both audiences and critics, and would see Lee Majors as Grandpa Max, and was directed by Alex Winter of Bill and Ted fame. Ben 10, Race Against Time, the Cartoon Network original movie, premiering November 21st at 8pm, only on Cartoon Network. Your favorite rubber pirate, Luffy, is back with all new episodes. Thank you, Smarty Pants! Bring them on already! After a little R&R, &R, One Piece is rejoining the Toonami ranks. Hey, now the fun starts big time! While 2007 would bring a lot of changes to various places on Cartoon Network, no part would see most change than Toonami. Toonami in 2007 would see most of its new programming airing instead on the online Toonami Jetstream service like reruns of Pokemon Johto League Champions and Ice Shield 21, although the series would only see five episodes airing on the service. The biggest change was in the look. You guys ready to make the magic happen? All right, boys, let's do this. Out of nowhere, with almost no warning, Toonami had a massive change in theming. While the show was still hosted by Tom, this being Tom 4, Tom would abandon the Absolution and Sarah to instead be on a planet-based station with new companions, Flash and D, who helped the new Tom run the Toonami broadcast. The biggest change would also be the new Tom, who would now have a face, which many would compare to Thomas the Tank Engine. The drastic change, and the fact that there was no real new shows airing on the block, would be an unfortunate sign of things to come, much sooner than anyone would anticipate. Adult Swim weeknights take on a distinctly culinary flavor with Robot Chicken and Aqua Teen Hunger Force scheduled at 12 and 12.15 respectively. Back on Adult Swim, 2007 was booming with new shows, each more insane and experimental than the last. First up would be The Drinky Crow Show, Based on the self syndicated comic strip Mackie's, the Drinky Crow Show followed the exploits of an alcoholic and depressed crow named Drinky and his Irish monkey friend Uncle Gabby. The show is best described as a surreal black comedy, focusing on ultra-violence and jokes about suicide. A short-lived series, only at 10 episodes, but one many Adult Swim fans will remember as a series that they thought maybe was a dream. Next up would be an even more fever dream of a series, Xavier, Renegade Angel. What doth life, 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 are we just fleshy blips in some meaningless stew of cosmic oblivion? Or is it vice reversa? Co-created by Vernon Chapman, who also voiced the titular Xavier, the show follows a wandering man of sorts, searching for answers to questions that haven't been asked yet, and questioning answers that nobody gave. Get your hands off his leg, you perv! Take that! Taste the pain! Take that! Taste the pain! It's cranberry sauce! Take, 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 take that! The show was a bizarre mix of computer animation and pseudo-intellectual diatribe a hidden gem of a series that lasted two seasons, an infinitely rewatchable and criminally underrated series. Oh yeah? You only got one peni? Let me see it. See with your eyes, not with your mouth. I'll call your bluff. I'll see your penis with your mouth, and I raise you with my hand. Auntie up Continuing with that fever dream feeling, Adult Swim would start producing live action programming for the block. The first show was a weird parody called Saul of the Mole Man. There was a mission underground, so they sent some explorers down. But the crewmen of any work died on their way to the center of the earth. And so we're left with 
Johnny Tambourine, a grumpy robot machine. And some alone, the de facto leader of the team. And now he's all of the Created as a, quote, ultra-patriotic Land of the Lost, Saul of the Mole Men was a live-action adventure show in the style of Land of the Lost and the Tom Baker era of Doctor Who, with bad acting, cheap sets, and monster costumes. Mostly played straight and emphasized for wackiness, it was short-lived at only one season. In the same style was the show Fat Guy Stuck in Internet. The show was a remake of a previous concept of the creator, Greg Gemberling's, made for the channel 102, a web series featuring different fake TV shows from different creators. The show was a sort of Tron parody of a hotshot programmer being stuck in the internet, and must fight to not only save himself, but the internet itself from a vague, shadowy evil. While similar to Saul in its cheesy parody style, Fat Guy was a little more self-aware with itself, pointing out at times when it got a little too wacky. Speaking of, we would get one last live-action show for the block, from two men who would continue to be fixtures for quite some time. Great job. Tim and Eric's awesome show Great Job is a sort of sketch variety show for the creators of Tom Goes to the Mayor. The show is filled to the brim with random skits featuring the team of Tim and Eric, as well as other guest stars and even random nobodies. The show was ahead of its time with cringe and awkward humor and oddball effects that made it stand out even on Adult Swim, but would make sure Tim and Eric, but more specifically Tim Heidecker, would be household names for years to come. Along with these, we would also see a few more anime airing on the block, including Astro Boy, Blood Plus, and the smash hit Death Note. A human who's used a Death Note can neither go to heaven nor hell for eternity. Once you actually start looking around, it makes you wonder if you'd be doing society a favor by getting rid of all these people. This world is rotten, and those who are making it rot deserve to die. 2008 would also see a lot of changes to the network. Many would argue that this was the most recognizable time for the start of its downfall. But while many things would change and end, we would also still see the spark of the network even still. The change of the year would also bring a change of look, introducing the Nudes era. The Nudes era would see bumpers and promos featuring little characters called Nudes, which would be based on the DIY toys called Money, which were little block vinyl figures that you could paint and design any way you wanted. In the same way, these Nudes would be painted with the design of different characters when the show is currently airing on the network, and be used to preview what was coming up next. With this new era came new shows, the first being a sequel to an existing one. Ben 10 Alien Force was the follow-up series to Ben 10, set five years after the events of the original series. Ben and Gwen are now teenagers, as is their former enemy, Kevin. With the disappearance of his grandpa, Max, Ben takes over as the leader, with a new Omnitrix, new aliens, and new villains to defeat. Continuing with the action series, Cartoon Network was looking for even more action adventure with the success of Ben 10, which would lead to the premiere of The Secret Saturdays. <laughs> 
Created by Jay Steven, based on his love of both old-school Hanna-Barbera adventure series and cryptozoology. The Secret Saturday is focused on the Saturday family, who travel the world searching for new species of cryptids, all the while being pursued by grifting television host V.V. Argost, who looks to exploit the cryptids. The action kept coming with a new addition to the Batman franchise. Batman Brave and the Bold was a series produced by WB Animation for Cartoon Network. Unlike the previous series, the Batman Animated Series and The Batman, the series was more light-hearted and intended for younger audiences. However, much like Justice League Unlimited, it still took advantage of the vast array of characters that DC had to offer, including team-ups with lesser-known heroes at the time, like Blue Beetle, Batmite, Firestorm, Ambush Bug, and even shorter team-ups, like with previous Cartoon Network and Hanna-Barbera mainstay, Space Ghost, voiced by the returning Gary Owens. Looks like Creature King got his just desserts. Actually, he'll probably be dessert. <laughs> While the lighter tone of the show was at first a bit controversial to some fans, Batman has a long history of camp under his cowl, and it's a series that's fondly remembered by old and new fans to this very day. But while these shows all had their audiences, it was the next show that would be a smash hit for the network and be responsible for shaping a universe for years to come. On May 19th, <laughs> the Jedi must unite. Oh, I have a bad feeling about this. By 2008, the world was still reflecting on the Star Wars prequel trilogy, which had just wrapped a few years previously with Revenge of the Sith. Afterwards, Lucasfilm was already hard at work on another movie which would capitalize on the gap of time between Attack of the Clones and Revenge of the Sith, highlighting the Clone Wars themselves. We need to make contact with General Kenobi. Kidnapped, Jabba the Hutt's son has been. The first step to this would be a new animated film released in theaters in 2008. The film would follow Anakin Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi as they led the fight in the Clone Wars but it would also be the introduction to future fan-favorite character, Ahsoka, introduced as Anakin's Jedi Padawan. The film would see her and Anakin work a mission of peace to rescue Jabba the Hutt's kidnapped son. While the film received mostly negative reviews, it did quite well at the box office, but worked as a pilot for one of the best Star Wars TV series of all time. The Jedi aren't just gonna sit by while Grievous and his droids take over the whole universe. At least, that's what Anakin says. I'm supposed to listen to him. He's my master. I may just be a Padawan, but soon, I will be a Jedi. And if that means I have to cut my way through a hundred droids, I will. Gladly. Star Wars The Clone Wars, a new adventure every Friday night, begins tomorrow at 9 p.m. on Cartoon Network. Star Wars The Clone Wars continues chronicling The Clone Wars, following not just Anakin, Ahsoka, and Obi-Wan, but also other characters like Yoda, Mace Windu, and gave even more individuality and personality to the clones themselves, allowing more of them to be seen as real characters. It would also see future developments of the fan-favorite villain Asaz Ventress, originally introduced in the 2D Clone Wars series. The series is well-remembered, and is still having elements that were introduced in this series used and incorporated in the Star Wars universe even now after Disney took over notably Ahsoka herself getting her own live-action series. But it wasn't all new action on Cartoon Network in 2008. We did get one original series that would highlight another type of adventure. Flapjack! Hey, Flapjack! Come with me, we'll go and see a place called Candid Island! Who needs Candid Island? It's safer at the docks. But there ain't no streams of sody pop to go trippin' down the rocks. It's dangerous and risky. But adventurous and free. Adventure, that's the life for me. There's lollipop trees and a lemonade sea. Doesn't sound very good to me. The Misadventures of Flapjack! The Marvelous Misadventures of Flapjack 
follow, as the name would suggest, the marvelous misadventures of a pirate adventurer wannabe, Flapjack. He's a young, naive boy who is the apprentice of sorts to a legendary pirate of sorts, Captain Knuckles, along with their friend slash ship slash mother figure, Bubby the Whale. They traveled the seas on various wacky adventures and to achieve their ultimate goal of finding the rumored paradise of Candy Island. In between adventures, the crew hang out on Stormalong Harbor, where live even more wacky and strange characters, including Peppermint Larry, the owner of the local candy bar, along with his wife, Candy Wife. The show had a great mix of slapstick, gross-out, and random-esque humor, a nice throwback to the style of cartoon that would be seen in previous eras of Cartoon Network, an island of itself, if you will. As well, Cartoon Network would pull more shows from Canada. In total, 2008 would see the airings of three different Canadian cartoons, the first being Johnny Test. Originally airing on Kids WB, it would soon move to Cartoon Network after season four, a show about the titular Johnny Test who lives his misadventures with his talking dog, Dookie. The biggest gimmick of the show would be Johnny being used as a guinea pig by his sisters in various experiments. Next would be 16, a very simple show about a group of kids hanging out at a mall with hilarious results. Life begins after school, that's when we bend all the rules, time to hang with all my friends, we like to be together, in a place where we belong, I'm 16, starting to find my way, got a new job, gonna start at the mall today. And of course, the juggernaut of the bunch, Total Drama Island. Your mom and dad, I'm doing fine. You guys are on my mind. You asked me what I wanted to be, and now I think the answer is playing to see. I want to be famous. I want to live close to the sun. Or pack your bags, because I've already won. Everything to prove, nothing in my way. Total Drama Island started as a simple survival parody with teens of different backgrounds competing in different challenges to win a big prize. This soon exploded into multiple seasons with multiple gimmicks in each one, with revolving and returning characters. The series would be a big hit for the network, spawning about six seasons, the most recent currently airing, and two spin-offs, The Ridiculous Race and Total Drama Rama, a sort of Muppet Babies version of the show with fan-favorite characters as younger kids. But while Cartoon Network was restructuring to find a new identity and take advantage of trends, it would end up ending one of the biggest things that made the channel unique for years. It's something that if people did stop watching Cartoon Network, they still remember. 11 years and counting. Raise your hand if you were alive during Toonami's launch. 
On September 20th, 2008, Cartoon Network would announce at a panel at Anime Weekend Atlanta that Toonami had been canceled due to low ratings. The block would air its final broadcast the same evening, its last show being a rerun of Samurai Jack. To say goodbye, Tom himself would address the audience directly, as the station previously running the broadcast was shut down around him. Well, this is the end, beautiful friends. After more than 11 years, this is Toonami's final broadcast. It's been a lot of fun, and we'd like to thank each and every one of you who've made this journey with us. Toonami wouldn't have been anything without you. Hopefully, we've left you with some good memories. So, until we meet again, stay gold. Bang. With that, Toonami was over. And so was an era of Cartoon Network that could never be recovered. On Adult Swim, we would see two original shows air on the block, the first being the ultra-violent acid trip known as Super Jam. While the pilot aired on the block a year before, the series would premiere in full in 2008, revolving around the titular super jail that houses the most dangerous criminals in the world in a hellscape of blood, death, destruction, and mayhem. The jail itself is watched over by the Warden, a maniacal Willy Wonka-like figure with god-like powers. Other staff of the prison include Jared, the prison's high-strung accountant, Alice, the mannish guard and love interest for the Warren, and the twins two supernatural beings who live to cause even more chaos to the jail than normal. Apart from horrific torture and violence depicted on the show, the other constant would be an opening sequence featuring Jackknife, a psychotic con committing some kind of horrific crime and being captured by Jailbot, the faithful servant bot of the warden. For live action, Adult Swim released Delocated, focusing on John, who after testifying against the mob, is put into witness protection with his wife and son. At the same time, they are also involved in a reality show about their lives, which requires them to disguise themselves in ski masks. The family moves to a loft in New York, joined by a series of federal agents and hunted by various Russian gangsters. The series was created and starred John Glasser as John, who has appeared in many different projects including for Adult Swim, like Stroker in Stroker and Hoop. The series managed to last three seasons, as well as getting a special for its season finale. 2008 would also be notable for Adult Swim's April Fool's prank, this year featuring an all-night marathon of the infamous So Bad It's Good movie, The Room. Of course, having to be censored for the movie's sex scenes. Hi. Can I help you? Yeah, can I have a dozen red roses, please? Oh, hi, Johnny. I didn't know it was you. Here you go. That's me. How much is it? It'll be $18. Here you go. Keep the change. Hi, doggy. You're my favorite customer. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye-bye. With all these new changes happening to Cartoon Network, it was starting to feel like a network far removed from its past and almost unrecognizable. But with an old era ending, things changing, 
and a new era dawning, we would start to see even more changes and a much more experimental take on the network. Some with very disastrous results, which we will cover next time on the History of Cartoon Network, Part 3.